today is a very, very a special day uh, because it's actually 172 uh, years today. O today is October 22 when something very significant happened in the life of what was to become the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What was it? It was a thing called a great disappointment. A great disappointment actually happened 172 years ago today. What I'd like to do today, if we possibly can, is just to have a look at what was that all about? What was the teaching that led to a great disappointment? Um, I've actually called our, our service today, um, Does God Care? God's Response to Humanity's Appeal for Justice. I don't know about you, but in my world, the cry that I am constantly hearing is please give us justice. We want justice. You know, I hear on, on the news, uh, night by night, someone outside the law courts, they're being interviewed, and their one appeal is please, please give us this thing called, called justice. That's what I'd like us to look at today. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you now because we want to say thank you for being our Lord and our God. Lord, I just want to pray that you might be here by your Holy Spirit as we open your word, as we share, as we talk together. Uh, Lord, I just pray that indeed you might bless our time together. We just ask and we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Why is God mute in the face of family violence? Have you ever had to suffer through issues of family violence? <coughs> Do you know, when, um, when I was growing up, I grew up in a, a family that suffered from family violence. It would go something like this. Myself and my brother would go to bed at night. Mum and Dad would put us in bed. But then we would start to hear mum and dad outside arguing between themselves. And it would get louder and louder and louder. And in my bed, I would start to sweat more and more and more because I wasn't sure where the argument was going to finish up. Can we go to the next slide? I was like that little boy there wanting to block my ears, but somehow not able to block my ears. I would go to school and my stomach was all churned up from what had happened the night before. Why is God mute in the face of family violence? That was a question that when I was growing up, I had to face. Let's go to the next question. Let's go one more, hit it again. Why does God say nothing to those who pollute and devastate and pillage the earth? Have a look at the next. Will God ever call man to account for destroying? Have you seen these types of pictures on television? These are coming across now with increasing regularity. Man has not only has the ability but he is destroying the earth. Is God ever going to call man to account for that? Let's go to the next picture. Is it true that clever tyrants are never punished? What do you think? Is it true that clever tyrants are never punished? Have you noticed how many people are able to get away with doing the wrong thing. Let's go to the next picture. Then there's another question. Why doesn't God say anything about the way the rich people oppress the poor? Next picture. This is Central Africa. These people, of course, just getting simple water. Water? That's water? We're going to drink that? On the other hand... We have people with wealth without limit. Does God care? One of the most significant questions 
that I believe Christianity is facing today is this question, does God care? And yet it's interesting. There is a Christian teaching that has been in Christianity right from the days of the apostles that is never mentioned today. In fact, I have to admit, this is probably the first time in, 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 in recent, probably the last decade, that I'm actually sharing particularly on this subject. This subject is not dealt with all that much, even within Christianity. Let's go to the next slide. Do the scriptures teach that man will be held accountable for the things that he does? This is really an important Christian teaching. Now, my friends, what I'm going to get you to do is to come in your, uh, your Bible because I want, to, I want you to pick up um, those people who were disappointed so many years ago. This was all background to them. But to us today, it's not background. But we're going to do a little bit of a Bible study. Do the Scriptures teach that man will be held accountable for the things that he does? Can we go to the next uh, punch it once more? Let's come to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And let's see what... Uh, I'm actually sharing what I normally share in a, um, in, a, a pro, in a seminar form today. So if you've got any questions, then um, we can actually allow that to happen too. Uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 and it's verse 13 and 14. Now, of course, those of you who know the book of Ecclesiastes, it's right in the middle of the Bible. You've got Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. So it's right towards the middle of the, the Bible. And Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 are the last two verses of, of this book. Now, this book is fantastic because what we've got, it's written by King Solomon and it's actually, um, he's examined systematically all the different things in life. He's experienced pleasure, he's experienced ladies, he's experienced wealth, he's ex all the various things, you, music and song, he's experienced them all and he's tested them as a wise man does. And then finally he comes to a conclusion. And let's see what, how he concludes his book. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 12 and it's verse 13 and 14 and he says this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into what? For God will bring every work. God is going to call people to account. Oh, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every what? Every what? Every hidden, every secret thing, whether it's good or evil. Now, you know, I don't mind if people know about the little old lady that I've helped cross the road, because that's a secret thing. Nobody else knows about that. I don't mind if everybody else knows that. But do you know, are there some things that you would rather people not know? One or two? Oh, for God will bring every work, including every secret thing. Oh, how, how do I deal with, this, with, with a passage like this? Let's go have a look, have a look at the next, next passage. Um, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. This is now in New Testament days. Now we've got the apostle uh, Paul speaking. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's verse uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it's verse, uh, verse 10. And Paul is here preaching to the, um, uh, to the Corinthians, and this is what he says. For we must all appear before the what? The judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done, what? In the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Oh. Do you know, frankly, I don't mind if Adolf Hitler gets his just desserts. Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. If Adolf, Idi Amin, 
If he gets his, his just desserts before God, bring it on. We must all appear before the... Now, what I'm sharing with you today is something that for centuries has been traditional Christian doctrine. But we do not preach on this subject today. Do you understand why? Ooh, let's go to the next one. This comes right through all the scriptures. Come to Acts chapter 24. This is, again, the New Testament. Acts 24, and it's verse 25. And here, the great apostle Paul is reasoning with a man called King Felix. And... um, uh, and this is what Paul says. Paul, you understand, is the, um, uh, is the prisoner and he's preaching to the king. He should do some, have some respect. But listen to what he says. Now, as he, that was Paul, reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment, and the what? Judgment to come. Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. Did you notice Felix's response? He was what? He was afraid. If you are afraid, could that be a reason why Christianity no longer preaches on this particular teaching? And yet the problem is, it flows right through the scriptures. Let's keep going. Let's have the next text here. Let's go to Hebrews 6 and verse 1 to 3. Hebrews 6 and verse 1 to 3. Here, um, again, the great apostle Paul is, uh, is preaching, and this is what he says. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection or completeness, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now, by the way, notice it says something here. Eternal judgment, it doesn't say eternal punishment. There's a very big difference. It says eternal judgment not eternal punishment. Very, very important teaching um, that that is actually picking up, but we're not going to come to it today. Do the scriptures teach that man will be held accountable for the things that he does? Do you know, I could keep going with this particular subject, but the thing that I've, I suppose I've come to conclude is that the scriptures do actually teach that man is going to be held accountable for the things that he has done, whether good or bad. Now, Felix, remember, what was Felix's reaction? He was afraid. Thank you, Betty. He was afraid. And as a result, he said, go away, Paul. When it's a convenient time, come back and I'll, you know, I'll call for you. He was afraid. And that's been the response of so many in the Christian world. But folks, let's go to the next slide. Do I need to fear, have fear in the judgment? Can we just hit the next, um, this passage? Let's come to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 22 because this is absolutely key. Um, My friends, there are so many who are afraid of the judgment and yet here is a a real passage of hope. I love this. Um, Daniel, um, and it's... uh, the great prophet Daniel, of course, is writing his book about six centuries before the birth of Christ, about six centuries BC. You know what's actually occurring here. Um, Daniel and his friends have been taken into captivity. Jerusalem has been destroyed and they've been taken over to, uh, over to Babylon. And Daniel gets given by God numerous visions. Daniel chapter 7 and verse, uh, verse 22. And, and, and by the way, If ever you want an exciting chapter, please read Daniel chapter 7. Did you know that um, John Knox, who is the father of the Presbyterian church, 
Do you know what subject he preached his very first sermon on? He was only 17 when he preached it. He actually took Daniel chapter 7, which is this, this particular chapter, and he preached to a congregation a bit bigger than this. Um, at his very first sermon, as a 17-year-old, he was the father of the Presbyterian Church. Um, up, way up in Scotland, I've been to the, uh, I've seen the documentation that uh, uh, at his uh, at his memorial and at his uh, at the place where he originally preached that uh, that sermon. But Daniel chapter seven and verse twenty two, I love what is actually uh, says uh, what um, uh, Daniel says here. Uh, we'll start with verse twenty one. I was watching, and the same horn, and we're not going to worry about the horn today was making war against the saints. So whatever this horn is, we're not trying to identify that today, was making war with the saints and prevailing against them. He was winning until the Ancient of Days came. Now notice, who came? The Ancient of Days. Now, please look at that because we're going to come back to this in just a moment. This is really important. Um, Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favour of who? The saints of the Most High God. Now, hang on a moment. Who are the saints? All who believe. believe. That's it. All who... This judgment is going to be made in favour of the saints of the Most High God. Do you fear the judgment? We've got the eternal God here who's about to get his wonderful gavel out. He's about to slam it down. He's about to say, let him go. Let him free. Because judgment is going to be made in favour of the saints of the Most High God. Have you made mistakes? Yeah. Have you taken them to Christ in prayer, saying, Lord, forgive me? Judgment will be made in favour of the saints of the Most High God. What a picture we get being painted here. Let's come to the next slide. Ah. Yes, let's come to um, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and it's, uh, it's verse, uh, verse 19. Um, I, I love, this is, the, uh, this is a sermon that, uh, that Peter is preaching. Um, he says this, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be what? May be what? May be blotted out. I love this. I love. Don't you wish you had a judge when you went to court that said, that says, "Hang on a moment. This person has confessed these sins. Throw the records into the fire." I, I look. I look at this and I say, "Hey, this is exciting stuff." Because what we've got is a God here. We've, yes, judgment is going to occur according to the scriptures. But the wonderful news about it is that do I need to fear the judgment? No, not if I've taken the sins beforehand to to Christ. Because he has forgiven all things. What what a blessing this is. Let's go to the next slide. In the judgment, Jesus promises his followers that he will not blot out their names out of the book of life. On the contrary, it will be the record of their sins that will be blotted out. Let's keep going. Judgment is not optional. But if we put our trust and confidence in Jesus, there's no need to be nervous. We can even look forward to the judgment. I love this. What a picture. Next one. But pastor, have you ever noticed, well, many of you here may not have children. When, I, when, when my children were young, there used to be a phrase that my children liked to use. It, was, it went something like this. But dad, but dad, what does but dad mean? I have an objection. I have an objection. There, there is actually a similar phrase I've discovered. It goes like this, but pastor, but pastor. Often when you're studying the Bible, but pastor, haven't you considered? Um, but pastor, why doesn't God simply take everyone to heaven? We have the next, uh, next picture. God will take to heaven everyone who would be happy there. If we don't enjoy time with God on earth, we certainly wouldn't enjoy it in heaven. God respects our choices. It's the same mercy that keeps some people out of heaven that allows others into heaven. The bottom line question in the judgment is going to be, are you going to be happy in the kingdom of God? 
Because, you know, there are some people who simply would not be happy in heaven. Do you agree with me? Let's go to the next slide. When will a judgment take place? Well, let's, let's come to our, our next slide. Let's come to Matthew chapter 25. Because, because now we start to create a little bit of a problem uh, that comes up for us. And by the way, a lot of what I'm sharing with you today is background to those people way back in 1844. They knew all of this, but I'm sharing with you a little bit of background to start with. Uh, Matthew chapter 25 and verse, um, verse 31. Matthew 25 and verse, uh, uh, verse 31. Uh, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, he will sit on his throne of his glory and all nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep and from his goats. And he'll set the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And so it goes on. You get a picture of what? What have we got a picture of here? It's a picture of judgment, isn't it? Christ has come and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the good from the bad, those who love him from those who... This is a picture of, of judgment that's occurring. Do you agree with me? All right, let's go to our next passage. Let's have a look at... Uh, what's our next text? Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 12. Revelation 22 and it's verse, uh, verse 12. Now, by the way, what time have I got to finish today? Before the second coming. I like that. I like that. That's very good. Thank you, Nathan. I like that. Okay. Um, Revelation 22 and verse 12. Um, uh, and it says this. Behold, I am coming quickly. This is Christ speaking. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is what? With me to give every man according to his work. What have we got happening at the second coming? We have a picture of what? We have a picture of judgment. That's what we've got. We've got a picture of judgment happening at the second coming. Let's go to the next slide, though. But this is where we get a, a little bit of a, a challenge coming in. This is the same question. When will judgment take place? Let's go to Revelation chapter uh, 14. Revelation chapter 14. And here there's a quite a remarkable, even an unusual passage. Let me share it with you. I saw another. Now, this occurs, by the way, if you look in Revelation chapter 14 and you look down at verse 14, you get the picture of Christ coming again. That happens later in the chapter. But before that um, second coming, you get some messages, messengers sent out to the whole earth. Look at what the first one is. Revelation 22 and verse 14. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. Now, this is, this. look at what it's saying here. This angel, the first angel, has been sent out to the entire earth with what message? What's the message? The everlasting gospel. What is the gospel? Who does the gospel concern? Who does, who? It concerns everybody. Okay, but the gospel is the good news of what? Of Jesus, Jesus coming, Jesus' um, death, Jesus' resurrection. We've got Jesus' salvation, that whole story. That, to me, is the gospel. But hang on a moment. Something goes wrong, apparently, here. And another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, saying... Now, hang on. This angel is saying a message which has been described as the everlasting gospel. Look at what the angel says. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Judgment has come. How is judgment gospel? Has the angel got it wrong? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. 
you see, the judgment hour message is actually a message of good news. Because at the time of the judgment, that is where the people of God are declared righteous. This, this is a message of good news. In fact, can I just say this to you? For those of you who are interested in theology, and I know some of you are very wise, therefore, and aren't, um, but there are some of us who are, there's actually only two places in the Bible where the gospel, the word gospel, is defined. One is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The second one is here. There's only two places in the Bible where the word gospel is physically defined. But the two definitions are different. And that is so important that we understand what's actually going on. Um, okay, Revelation 14, chapter 6. Um, uh, uh, this is not judgment, but rather an announcement to those on earth that the time of judgment has come. Why would God do that? Why would God send out a, a message saying with a loud God, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come? You know, on this earth, if you were going to be called into court and you were given no notice of the fact that you were going to be brought into court, what would you say of the court system? Something There's something wrong here. Uh, Uh, that's exactly. Do you want to read that verse for Acts 14 and 15? Do you want to read that? In saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all the things that are in them. Okay, and to me, the thing I love about that passage there, I thank you for that, is the fact that what we're talking about is worship in that verse, the Creator God. Just as in Revelation 14, 6, you get a message to worship the creator God. Now, I ask you something, my friends. Why would it be, why would God send to our era a message that says, I want you to worship the creator God? For eons through Christian history, that wasn't the case. What's happening today? They're not worshipping the, the, the creator God. They don't believe in a creator God. And it happens very easily, doesn't it? <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Okay, let's. I want you to notice here that what we've got is that in this passage, you've got judgment. It does occur when Christ comes. The sheep and the goats are actually separated. But here, there is a message that says before Christ comes, you see, you get this. The first message is followed by a second, and the second by a third, and after the third, then Christ comes. After after we get this message of judgment going to the whole world, which is described as gospel, then Christ comes. You see, apparently, there is something to do with judgment that is happening before Christ comes. All right, let's go to the next, to the next, um, the next slide. Daniel also sees a judgment scene before Christ comes. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7 again. And this is the, the same, same chapter John Knox preached on uh, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, he knew, he understood, and by the way, most of what I preach today has been plagiarised. Okay? I am, have to admit, I'm a play. Most of what I preach today on biblical prophecy actually comes from the Protestant reformers because they all believed virtually the same thing on this particular subject. Um, uh, Daniel chapter 7 uh, and it's uh, verse 9 to 11 and uh, here we've got um, um, I watched till thrones were put in place and this is the judgment scene again. And the Ancient of Days was seated. And the garment was as white as snow. His hair of his head was like pure wool. Notice again, who's doing the judging here, folks? Who is he called? The Ancient of Days. The ancient of days. Who is the Ancient of Days? 
we're going to come to this and have a look at this in a minute. His throne was a fiery flame and the wheels are burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the court was seated and the what? The books were open. We might say the videotapes were hit. The books were open. The videotapes were hit. That's what I imagine is happening here. Um, but that's verse 11. While the judgment is taking place in verse 11... I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. Now, we're not going to try to identify who this horn is. We can, but we're not going to today. But while the judgment is taking place, Daniel is able to watch because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. You see, apparently, there is a judgment that is occurring while this horn is speaking pompous words and by the way the protestant reformers to a man knew who that horn was let's keep going next slide a reward must firstly be determined before it can be given therefore there's a time prior to christ's return when judgment decisions are apparently taking place next slide Okay, this question is vital. Who is the key player in the judgment? Now, the reason I ask this question is this. Do you know there are some people who see Satan as being the key player in the judgment? He is not the key player in the judgment. Can we just have the next, um, uh, the next slide, please? Uh, so let's come to John chapter 5 and verse 22. Let's find out who the key player in the judgment is. John 5 and verse uh, verse 22. For the Father judges who? The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment To who? To the Son. But hang on a moment. In the book of Daniel, what was the judge called? The Ancient of Days. Do you understand why our understanding of Trinity is so important here? Here we have got the Ancient of Days, who Jesus is saying is none other than himself, going, now, why is that good news? Who is your defence attorney in the heavenly kingdom? Jesus. Jesus. Who is your judge? If the defence attorney and the judge are the same person, what are your chances? It's rigged in your favour. But is that fair? Yes, it is. I'll tell you why it is fair. It's It's fair because the heavenly constitution says that it's fair. And if the Constitution says it's fair, it is fair. Yeah. There's something worth it there too, and that's sown up in 1 John chapter five, uh, 1, verses 5 to 10. You've got to come clean. And believe me, we're going to come there. <laughs> we're coming there. Uh, th- th- this is good. This is good. I'm glad people are studying their scriptures and understand the scriptures because this is important. You know, there is a big picture today. There are so, my friends, there are so many in even Adventism who don't understand these things. Let's keep going. Now, I'm going to get into trouble for my time in a moment. Okay, let's go to the, next, to the next, uh, next picture. Do we have any idea when the judgment era begins? Let's go to the next slide. Yes, we do. We do. We have a perfect... We have a, a wonderful understanding of when it begins. Yes, we do. But here's the writer, and please pick this up. It is written in the book of Daniel, but it is written in code. All right? I'm, any of you into code? I, I love it. This is written in code. Let's have the next slide. Let's have a look at the code. Let's go to Daniel 8.14. Let's have a look at this code. Daniel 8 
and it's verse, uh, verse 14. Now, this, for those of you who may not be familiar with this chapter, this is part of a very large vision that the prophet Daniel was given. Part of a very large vision. Um, and there is a statement made there, but it actually concerns the judgment. And we're going to see how in a moment. Daniel 8 and verse 14. He said unto me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What does that mean? 2,300 days and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What has that got to do with the issue of the judgment? My friends, can I make a suggestion to you? In that passage, you actually have two coded information packages. Absolutely and vitally we understand what these coded information packages are. Let's have the next slide. That's it. Code packet one. What is Daniel speaking about in this text? What does Daniel mean when he speaks of the, the sanctuary will be cleansed? What does he speaking of when he does that? Let's have the next slide. Daniel is speaking of none other than the Day of Atonement or what we would call today, the Jews would call today, Yom Kippur. On this day, that was the day that the sanctuary was symbolically cleansed. That's what he's speaking of. Now, get this. The angel is speaking to Daniel and he says that the vision that you've seen will result in the cleansing of the sanctuary 2,300 days. Two information packages there, but they're code. Let's, let's decipher this one. Next, can we have the next, next slide, please? What is Yom Kippur? How does it fit into judgment? Well, I actually went online, judaismabout.com. Everything, we all know that uh, all good things come off the internet. Um, so um, I, um, I simply asked the question, what is Yom Kippur? Can I read you what they told me? Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. By the way, the word atonement is actually made up of three words. What are they? At one meant. The Day of Atonement is the day in which people became at one meant with their God. That's where the word atonement comes from. Uh, the, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is one of two Jewish holy days. The purpose of Yom Kippur um, is to bring about, get this, I love this, reconciliation between people and between individuals and their God. The day when the sanctuary is cleansed is the Day of Atonement. It is the day in which it was designed to bring reconciliation between people and their God, and between each other. According to Jewish tradition, this is also the day when God decides the fate of each human being. That's judgment. Yom Kippur. That's what this is talking about. Uh, although Yom Kippur is an intense holiday, it is nevertheless viewed as a happy day. Why? Because uh, if one has observed the holiday properly, by the end of Yom Kippur, uh, they will have made peace with all others and with God. There are three essential components of Yom Kippur. There is, the first part is repentance. Listen to this. Yom Kippur is the day of reconciliation when the Jews strive to make amends with people and to draw closer with God through prayer and fasting. Um, the service on the day of, day of Yom Kippur lasts from morning until nightfall. Many prayers are said, but one is repeated at intervals throughout the service. Uh, the prayer is called the al kahet and, it's, and it asks for forgiveness for a variety of sins which may have been committed during the year. Just listen to some of these things. They pray for the sin we have committed under stress or through choice. For those sins that we've committed in stubbornness and in error. 
for those sins we've committed in, um, uh, by evil meditations of our heart, for the sins that we've committed by word of mouth, for the sins that we've committed through abuse of our power, for the sins that we've committed by exploitation of our neighbours. For these sins, O oh God of forgiveness, bear with us, pardon us and forgive us. What's happening on the Day of Atonement? God and his people are coming together. People are coming together. This is the Day of Atonement. And Yom Kippur. When you see, my friend, what's happening in the book of Daniel is Daniel is actually writing in terms that he fully understands. But you see, Daniel is a 6th century BC prophet. He's in the book, he's in, the, uh, he's in Babylon. We, we don't even use these terms anymore, which means for us they're like code. But for Daniel, this, um, uh, this cleansing of the sanctuary was actually in his mind the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. And what was Yom Kippur? Well, that was the Day of Judgment. That was the day in which man and God came together were reconciled together in a very special way, were restored together. Oh, what a, what a picture we've actually got here. Code number one. What is unto 2,300 days? Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? Well, it's a day of judgment. But is it a judgment to be feared? No, not a judgment to be feared. Because judgment is about to be made by the judge, the righteous judge, in favour of the saints of the Most High God. That's what's in Daniel's mind. But hang on. Then you've got the next phrase, the next little code. Unto 2,300 days. Then there will be, if you like, putting it into my terminology, there will be complete reconciliation will occur. We will be coming together. There will be of God and his people. My friends, can I say something to you? I believe right now, more than anything else, God and his people need to come together. Do you know, the Christian church has wandered a long way from the principles of their fathers. The Seventh-day Adventist church has moved a long way for the, from the principles of their fathers. This message of judgment, I believe, is the most applicable message to us today. Let's go to the second coded information package. Let's go to the next one. Code packet two. What is Daniel speaking about? What does Daniel mean when he says that under 2,300 days, then you shall have this reconciliation event will actually uh, take place? Let's have a look. Let's have the next slide. Well, let me firstly go back to my friends, the Reformation scholars. By the way, in answering this question, did you know that this year is the five, sorry, next year is going to be the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation commencing in Germany? On October, All Saints Day next year, uh, is actually the 500th anniversary when Martin Luther took his 95 theses and nailed them to the castle door in Wittenberg. There is going to be some major um, celebrations occurring and some major unification is going to occur at the same time. And I personally believe there are huge problems with that. But let's... Reformation scholars such as Wycliffe, Knox, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, Sir Isaac Newton, Huss Jerome, Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Charles Finney, C.H. Spurgeon, saw in biblical prophecy a remarkable code that unveiled human history. My friends, please, you know, please, if any of you are studying biblical prophecy... Please look at what these men actually taught in addition to what you might see in the books of today because there is a huge difference. But I believe that there is light that comes from these uh, Reformation scholars like I have seen nowhere else. Let's go um, to uh, let's the next slide if we can. One of the principles that 
many of these men, and I have to say many because it was not all of them on this particular point. Um, one prophetic day equals one literal year. I can show it to you in a number of places, but my friends, we don't have time to do it today. Let's go to the next slide. It's most clearly demonstrated in the Messianic 70-week prophecy. Did you know that by utilising this year-day principle that the coming of Christ was forecast uh, 400 years in advance of his coming? We know who Christ was because of biblical prophecy. Pro Christ came right on time. By using the same principle, this larger prophecy, 2,300 years, then shall a time of judgment, good news judgment, with God's people coming together with him, then that is going to occur. Does this make sense? Am I going too quickly? I hope I'm not. Let's go to the next slide. My friends, what was October 22, 1844? Why was it significant? Because it was a study of this prophecy that resulted in the creation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Come with me, if you will, to your... Back to your scriptures again. Let me just explain this. I won't try to, to go into this, uh, this today. Uh, Daniel chapter, chapter 9. And uh, it's, um, it's verse 20, 25. These 2,300 days or 2,300 years, when do they begin? Well, they're actually cut off from a from a, a smaller prophecy. But I want you to look at this prophecy, this smaller prophecy, because it actually gives us a, a starting date. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know, Daniel, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be, and then a time period is actually given. Do you get this? Do you hear what you've just read? From, know and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be a period of time. What's he saying? Here we've got the prophet Daniel, 400 years before Christ, turning around, 500 years before Christ, turning around and saying that here we have got that the Messiah is going to come 490 years, because that's what it works out at, 490 years after the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, do we know when Jerusalem was to be restored and built? Well, yeah, we do. Actually, it's found in Ezra and Nehemiah um, is where that date is actually found. Uh, but 457 BC, we know exactly when Christ was due to come to this earth. That's cut off from a 2,300-year period that takes us through to about 1844. What did the Daniel say was going to occur at the end of that longer period? Well, at the end of that longer period, we were going to see a judgment take place. Judgment was going to commence in the heavenly sanctuary. Judgment is going to be given in favour of the Most High God. And a judgment message is going to commence to be preached. Why is it so important? Do you know, right now, there is a great number of things that are not being said within Christianity that should be getting said. Christianity has largely become a social gospel today. Has it not? A social gospel. You know, my friends, I, I just wonder if in fact we're not at a time where God is wanting to give some very powerful teaching to the wider 
Christian church and even the wider world. What sort of teaching do I believe I'm speaking about? Well, let's go back to Revelation 14 again and just have a look at this particular passage because I believe these are messages that seem to be sent out by God just before he chooses to come again. I saw another angel, Revelation 14, verse 6, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Do you know, so, so important that we commence with the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, not just to Christian people, but to everybody. But saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Do you know, I believe the judgment concerns Jesus Christ. It concerns his life. It concerns his death. It concerns his resurrection. It concerns uh, the impact that it has on you and me. But do you know, there is also good news in the judgment to come. This is very good news according to this angel. And then you've got a second angel and a third, but we won't go into those, uh, those angels uh, today. Let's come, to, um, let's come to the next, um, next passage. Um, what is the purpose of the judgment? Daniel chapter 7 and verse 18 says this. But the saints of the Most High shall receive what? The kingdom. Shall possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. I'm just a, a little... Do you ever get sick of this world? With some of the struggles, the hassles, the disappointments, the pain, the suffering that you face in this world? This is an incredible passage of hope. The saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. But pastor... Let's go to the next slide. But pastor... Ever, where did I say we, we taught that before? But pastor, why does Christ not act now rather than in the sweet by and by? Have you ever wondered that? Why doesn't he act now instead of in the sweet by and by? Well, let's come to uh, our next, next text. This is our last text, by the way. Let's come to 2 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 19. Why doesn't he act right now Instead of at some time in the future. Second, Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning, concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should what? Perish, but that all should come to repent. Why doesn't he act now? I mean, I wish, I wish those rotters in this world would get what's coming for them right now. Don't you wish they'd get it right now instead of sometime in the future? You know, I'm, I'm so thankful that I actually serve a God who's prepared to say, I'm prepared to wait because perhaps if I wait just a little longer, that man, that woman, that child, that person might come to repentance. Then if they come to repentance, when I investigate their case in the heavenly judgment, what can I do with their sins? What can I do with them? I take them to the big celestial bonfire and I throw them into the big celestial bonfire and they are no more. Judgment is going to be made in favour of the saints of the Most High God. Do you know, I do believe that the Scriptures actually teach some remarkable doctrine that is very rarely spoken of today. And yet, under it all, there is amazing hope. And as our brother also said, there is, there is something, there is more to this particular subject and I, I'm just so thankful that we've got a God that sees us 
as, as, our, as his sons, daughters, heirs, kings, as their ambassadors, as his ambassadors. And he wants, he wants so much to be able to say, you're forgiven, my friend. Come on in to my kingdom. Lord, we just come to you now. We want to say thank you for the way that you lead and guide in our life. Lord, this is the most amazing teaching. Lord, this is a teaching that is in the scriptures. Lord, yeah, I just pray for each person here. Lord, I just just want to pray that you might um, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, the first work of that Holy Spirit is to convict of sin. Uh, Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody that's not walking with you, that indeed you might convict them right now. You might touch them. Lord, you might, um, might challenge them. That indeed they might bring those, that sin which they are committing to you, before the, to you before the judgment. That you can commit it to the great celestial bonfire. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you might bless each person here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.